Wonderful. I have started recording now. Okay. I think many of us joined. We are fine. You're able to see the slides now? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. All right, can, uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, I think we should go ahead and, and get started. Um, I'm Matt Thatcher. I'm the chair of the Department of Computer Science and Engineering here at USC. I just want to thank everyone for joining us. Our speaker today is Dr. Christian O'Reilly. He's a candidate for a faculty position in the intersection of artificial intelligence and neuroscience. He's uh, currently a research associate at the Montreal Neurological Institute at McGill University. He's very diverse background in electrical engineering, biomedical engineering, scientific program, machine learning, great publication record. And his recent research is focused on uh, the neuroscience of sleep and neurodevelopmental disorders like autism. And so I think he'll talk a little bit about his work today. And so I just, with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Christian O'Reilly. My apologies for the delay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, sorry for not being able to join you uh, earlier. Uh, it looks like we still have some uh, software and computer engineering to do. <laughs> um, computer <it's>, awful. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really delighted to, to have the occasion to give this talk uh, today. Uh, I will be discussing on uh, how to empower study of neurodevelopmental disorder through benchmarking and modeling. So uh, we all know in engineering that uh, for decades now, uh, the, uh, the ability to model has really been the bedrock on which uh, medicine, science, and engineering uh, have, have been built. And nowadays, almost any uh, system, uh, either man-made or biological, uh, is modeled in uh, different aspects. So this modeling work allows us, for example, to uh, better uh, predict how a system will react on unforeseen uh, situations, or it helps us also if, if the system is more uh, black box or gray box, as in, it's often the case in biology, it helps us start to gain some more insight of, uh, into the inner working of the system. So my talk will really uh, be centering around uh, uh, modeling in the neuroscience and it will be uh, separated into a big part, one that is more retrospective, where I will be uh, discussing, uh, presenting example of modeling in neuroscience at different scale. And these will be also uh, an occasion if you want to uh, show you the different kind of modeling that I, I did in, in pre my previous work. And the second part is more prospective uh, and I will discuss uh, how I would uh, I propose to put it all together to be able to uh, better empower the study of neurodevelopmental disorders. So starting with example of modeling in neuroscience at different scale, I will cover uh, three scales, which uh, in the context of this, call, uh, of this uh, presentation, I will uh, refer to the macroscopic scale as being the whole brain, uh, the whole brain scale, and the microscopic scale will be the cellular scale. Uh, the mesoscopic scale in between is uh, the scale of cortical columns or small uh, for local uh, cell assemblies in the brain. So starting at the macroscopic scale, when I, when I started my uh, graduate study, I was working in a laboratory where we were interested uh, into, uh, in, in motor control. And uh, we were using um, an approach uh, to study the kinematics of movements uh, by decomposing uh, the speed of the movement into log normal components. For example, for a same, simple pointing movement, you can decompose the, this movement into uh, log normals that one would uh, model the contribution of the agonist uh, neuro neuromuscular system, which push the end effector towards the target, and one uh, component that would be antagonist to the movement, which uh, helps you to break uh, the movement uh, so that you don't overshoot your target. 
So you can model the, the speed, the typical speed of these movements as uh, a subtraction of uh, two log normals that are uh, weighted by uh, the respective amplitude of these two components and uh, time shifted by the, the time at which the, the um, comment is, is given, if you want. Now we generalize this approach uh, to more complex uh, head, um, uh, movements uh, on the on the planner scale. So we were using a, a planner digitizer to record, for example, a handwritten signature or or handwriting. And uh, by generalizing this this approach to model. Um, log normal components to extract, uh, they, they compose, if you want, a complex movement into log normal components. We were able to uh, apply this uh, kind of approach to uh, various uh, applications, uh, some more in uh, typical pattern recognition, machine learning uh, topics like uh, handwriting recognition or, or uh, signature, handwritten signature verification and some more related to biomedical engineering. So uh, using these models to estimate the parameters of the neuromuscular system to uh, study how they correlate with uh, different conditions. So at the end of uh, my graduate study, I wanted to recenter my um, focus of application uh, of study more uh, into how the brain works. So I moved to uh, uh, laboratory that was studying uh, sleep. Uh, and I was, uh, during this period, most, uh, most interested by sleep spindles, which are uh, in, the, in the EG, in the electroencephalogram, they, they show up as a transient uh, waves. So it's a burst of activity in the 11, 16 Hertz uh, frequency band, and they last between 0.5 to 3 seconds. And they are really a thalamocortical rhythms. We now know that they are generated by the thalamus and they are propagated to the cortex and, there's a, a, and they are also modulated uh, by a feedback from the cortex. So uh, to study these, these rhythms, uh, I wanted to better describe them because we know that the sleep spindles are correlated with different uh, processes like memory consolidation during sleep, and they are also correlated with different uh, disease. So I wanted to better characterize them. So I, I developed new ways to characterize them. For example, uh, characterizing their propagation along the skull, uh, propagating of um, characterizing also how their frequency uh, varies uh, during a, a given uh, sleep spindle. I was also very interested by developing better approach to uh, automatically extract these um, these events from uh, polysomnographic recording. So you can imagine uh, when you're studying sleep, you you have recording, e.g., recording that lasts for uh, for uh, something like eight hours. And if you have a large database that's a hundred subjects, it means that someone has to go through uh, eight hour times a hundred subjects and uh, identify all these sleep spindles and a uh, wide variety of other um, uh, transient activity artifacts and uh, sleep stages. So it's a, it's a very time consuming uh, work. So I propose uh, different uh, detectors for sleep spindles. And I was also very interested in uh, having a really systematic way to benchmark them, to compare them because in the literature, there were any uh, such detector that had been proposed, but they were all evaluated on different data sets uh, scored by different experts. So the, the difference between their performance was uh, likely to be um, uh, smaller than the effect that just uh, using different database to assess these system had. And that's what uh, I demonstrated in, the, in one of my paper. So it showed really the importance of uh, having a standard uh, benchmark, a standard database to do that. And we also, in a different paper that I didn't include here, that uh, we proposed an open access uh, sleep uh, database to uh, benchmark these um, uh, sleep spindles and other uh, uh, events that needs to be scored in the sleep, like uh, sleep stages. So we applied. Uh, these different contribution to uh, various application, uh, um, for example, correlating sleep spindles with uh, 
with uh, different disease like uh, uh, rent behavior disorder. And uh, at the end of this uh, two years of uh, postdoctoral studies in this lab, I wanted to go one uh, step deeper. So um, I wanted to have a better insight in um, what uh, were these data that I was working with. So when you work with the, with the grid of, of sensors that are uh, put on the scalp, there's a lot of things that, could, uh, that can um, be uh, captured by these signals. Uh, different type of biological processes, but also different kind of uh, artifacts, either uh, biological or environmental. So a first step to get closer to uh, understanding uh, with more uh, depth how, how these uh, signals were generated was to um, estimate uh, their source in, in the brain. So that you can do through a process uh, called source estimation. And uh, so for that, you, you need to have a model of, of, your, of the head of the participants so that you can, uh, so that you can build a, fo a forward model. So uh, this forward model allows you to, to say, okay, if I had a dipole source at this place in the, in the brain, what will be the resulting uh, activity on the skull? And when you have this forward model, then you can inverse it so that you can actually estimate the, the sources that generated the EG that you, uh, that you observe. So uh, that's fine. Uh, normally you would do it ideally with uh, MRI that have been uh, recorded in, in these subjects so that you have a model that represents the specific head of the specific subject. But when you don't have this, what you normally would use as a, as a alternative solution is a template that represents the average head, if you want, of uh, the target population. And that's okay when you are working with uh, adult, healthy adults. But in my case, uh, I was interested in uh, neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, so neuro neurodevelopmental population, infants. Um, so we proposed with uh, collaborators, uh, including uh, John Richards, actually, from, uh, uh, from your university, uh, some uh, head, mo head models that uh, help us uh, study uh, cortical source in, uh, in EG in, in these uh, neurodevelopmental population. So that's, that's, that's the first step to better understand the uh, EG signal that you get. But you're still uh, up working with signal that are um, kind of uh, emerging, um, like the results of the interaction of many, many uh, uh, individual cells. And to, to better understand the um, generative mechanism, you have to go one uh, uh, scale lower. So, um, so I got interested in um, studying the generative mechanism at the mesoscopic scale. So roughly at the scale of the cortical column or, or small brain region, if you want. So uh, when you want to, to study uh, the generative mechanism of EG at that scale, one good approach to do it is to use neural mass models. So neural mass models study the, or model the average behavior of, of populations of cells. So for example, in the, in the picture I, I'm showing there, um, you have a, a network of interconnected cells. So I color coded, uh, for example, for this example, three populations. So let's say the blue are pyridal cells, the, the, the yellow uh, might be basket cells, and the uh, blue, uh, uh, orange uh, would be a chandelier cells, for example. So you're not interested at that level to model the specific behavior of each of these cells. What you, what you do is that you model as an independent system, well, independent but coupled system, um, each of these subpopulations. So you can model them uh, as system of differential equation. And th these, these systems can be rather complex because you can um, uh, add to, to these model different biological uh, phenomenon depending on what you are most interested in. For example, you can capture the, uh, the dynamics of uh, activation, the inactivation of uh, ionic channels and the neurons or uh, the 
um, process of uh, facilitation at, at the synapse or, or uh, this, this kind of biological um, phenomenon. Um, however, the general approach is not that uh, complicated. Uh, to, to, to develop the, the, this approach, you basically mean, need to uh, consider, um, for example, in this case, the mean firing rate as, a, as the input for your uh, neural uh, population. So you take this mean, uh, uh, this mean firing rate that it impinge on your population and of neuron, and you can, from uh, this mean firing rate, estimate the mean membrane potential that will result out of it. Um, and to do that, you uh, have to um, use a convolution um, of this mean firing rate with uh, synaptic transfer function, which basically captures the dynamics uh, at the synapse, so how uh, how the action potential are, uh, arriving at the synapse is um, transformed, if you want, into a postsynaptic potential. So, uh, of course, if you have a higher mean firing rate, uh, excitatory mean firing rate at the, at the synapse of your population, this will uh, depolarize your population uh, of cells, so you will have a mean membrane potential that will increase. Now you can link this mean membrane potential with the outgoing uh, mean firing rate. So uh, for example, if, if you have a population that is more depolarized, of course, they will tend to uh, fire more action potentials. Or the, the other way around, if it's less uh, polarized, it's, it's more hyperpolarized, uh, it will tend to fire less uh, action potential. So generally, this relationship is modeled through a sigmoidal curve. And uh, so you have these kind of model for each of your uh, subpopulation. And you can now interlink them. Uh, and for example, in the, one of the platform that has been developed to, to do this at scale is this virtual brain where you, uh, you can model as neural mass model the different node of, uh, of the brain uh, as parcelated according to an atlas. And then uh, you can apply, uh, interconnect these different regions uh, using a connectivity matrix uh, evaluated, for example, from uh, diffusion uh, MRI. So that gives you a forward uh, model uh, for how the macroscopic EEG is generated by mechanism at the at the more uh, mesoscopic scale. Uh, but in my in my case, I was interested by uh, applying this approach to study the connectivity uh, uh, at that at that time, and I, uh, so I was really interested in thalamocortical connectivity. So we um, uh, we we developed this uh, model of the thalamocortical system. In collaboration with Carl Friston at the, the University College of London. And the interesting thing here is that these uh, neural mass model can also be uh, uh, used, uh, you can invert, invert them. So you can have an inverse modeling of, 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 these, uh, of these models. So to be able to estimate the value of the parameters in your neural mass model, from uh, EEG that is collected uh, at the macroscopic scale on, on individual subjects. So it already started to build this bridge where uh, from macroscopic recording, you are able to estimate parameters of a model that describe phenomenon at a lower scale, as a mesoscopic scale. So uh, that was very interesting. Unfortunately, uh, for due to financial reasons, so we were expecting a grant that didn't uh, work. Uh, so I could not uh, uh, continue working on that project. And at the same time, I was um, starting to feel that I wanted to have a better understanding of how the cells themselves are working. So if you want to, to model or study the average behavior of a population of cells, uh, it's very good to have a good understanding of the biology of the cells. So at that time, there was an open position for uh, leading um, the modeling of the thalamocortical loop uh, at the cellular level, so at the microscopic scale. So I took, uh, I took this, this position, and for three years, uh, I worked at the, uh, at the EPFL on the, in the Blue Brain project to uh, implement their pipeline for uh, the uh, thalamocortical model. So you have it on this slide on the left side an example of 
what this model looks like. So here it's for a cortical column. And these, these models can be used to do uh, what we call in silico experiment. For example, the, uh, the second uh, figure here is a depiction of um, a, retrograde, a retrograde uh, labeling of all the cells connected to the central uh, pyramidal cells in this cortical column. So that's a, a kind of experiment that you could do in the lab and you would have a similar, uh, a similar image if you want to, uh, uh, through experimental means. But here you can reproduce it completely in, in, a, in a computer. So how these uh, models are built, um, so it's, it's a rather uh, involved process, but the, the concept behind it, the, behind it is, are not too complicated. Um, so the first thing that you need to do is to uh, identify in, in the brain regions of interest the different uh, morphological types that are there. So you need for that to have actual uh, living samples of uh, the brain region that you are interested in. And what you'll do is that you'll uh, inject uh, individual cell with a staining agent, for example, biocytin. That makes these cells uh, stand out from the background so that you can image them. So you, you image them in, in 3D. So you have a stack of images and then you can use uh, software that has been specially built for, for uh, reconstructing uh, these cells uh, in 3D and, and then you obtain, uh, you see on the uh, complete right, uh, an image there of uh, thalamocortical cells that we reconstructed for, for this project. So these are from, uh, from uh, rodents, uh, from rats, uh, but you can also do it from tissue resected for medical reasons. For example, if there's a brain tumor, uh, you will want to remove the brain tumor. You will not use the, the part of the tissue that are uh, affected by the brain tumor, but uh, typically, you will have to, to remove the brain tumor. You'll also have to remove a certain amount of tissue that are same. So you can use uh, these tissue to do this kind of modeling in humans. So if you do that with a sufficient number of cells, you start to be able to build the, these kind of uh, catalog of cells. Uh, so you catalog of 3D models of these different cell types. And now you can start to uh, go back in your model and start to uh, fill the region that you want to model with these different cell types in proportion that are uh, coherent, consistent with the literature. And then you will interconnect them again, following rules that you observe, uh, either that you get from the literature or that you observe in uh, true experiments. Uh, when you have done that, you have finished uh, the anima anatomical modeling, if you want, of your brain region. The, the second part is to model the physiology, so how these cells behave. So the first thing uh, that you want to do is to go back in uh, your living tissue and uh, characterize this electrophysiology. So this can be done, for example, uh, using uh, patch, clamp ex uh, patch clamp experiments. So in, in, at the blue brain, the, the um, uh, develop a comprehensive battery of stimuli to be uh, applied to these cells. So, so basically you have the cell in your slice of tissue and you insert um, an electrode uh, uh, that, that you will uh, be able to use to stimulate the cell. And you can inject a, a whole battery of stimuli, so depolarization, a pulse, hyperpolarization pulse, a voltage ramp, a oscillatory signal, a wide range of uh, signals and at the same time you record the reaction of the cells to these uh, depolariz depolarization or hyperpolarization. And when you have uh, you have run um, uh, the whole experiment, uh, you have a, a rather detailed set of uh, recording that allows you to characterize the input-output relationship in these cells. So this input-output relationship, you can model it using, uh, for example, we, we, we used um, a simulator uh, well-known in, in this field, which is named uh, Neuron. Um, and this, this simulator used a cable equation for uh, modeling passive current, uh, cur electrical current along passive uh, neurites and the Hodgkin Oxley type of modeling for the a wide variety of ionic currents that have been um, assessed in biological tissues and also uh, studied in the literature. 
So when you well, once you've done this modeling, you again here again here you are able to build this kind of catalog of um, of models, but here are uh, electrophysiological models that describe the behavior of the different cell types in this model. So now you are able to uh, um, associate a specific behavior with the different cells that you uh, already put in your model. And then you, uh, you need also to model the behavior at the synapse. Synapse can be uh, of different type depending of, of the, which type of cells connect to which type. So they can either be uh, facilitating, depressing, or pseudolinear. So you have to uh, uh, assess what kind of synapse you have and to model their behavior. And once you have done the, this, you finally want to model some kind of afferent that will uh, helps you to stimulate the, the circuit. For example, if here, if you have a cortical column, these would be uh, thalamocortical projections to the cortical column. And once you have this, you can actually perform in silico experiment where you uh, can reproduce uh, in details uh, experiment that you could do in the lab or experiment that you could not do in the lab. And um, what is really powerful here is that uh, you have a complete description of the behavior of all the cells uh, of, of, the, uh, of this brain region uh, for the duration of your experiment. So you, you can start to do all sorts of analysis on these data, such as uh, graph, anal uh, graph theory uh, uh, kind of analysis. So that's a really powerful approach. Um, so it gives you an idea of different approach uh, to modeling in neuroscience at different scale. Now, uh, having worked at these different scale, I came to the conclusion that uh, each of these scale have different advantages, but also different uh, limitations. For example, when you are working at the macroscopic scale, it's, it's really good for uh, clinical applica uh, application because you, you are working with data that are generally coming from non-invasive uh, recording modalities and that are closely linked with uh, clinical cases. So you can really easily relate um, the outcome of your work for, to clinical application, for example, developing biomarkers or things like that. But you have really little understanding of the generative mechanism of the data you are working with. When you go at the mesoscopic scale, you gain a bit more understanding of the generative mechanism, more power on uh, um, studying these mechanisms and modeling them uh, and simulating them. Uh, but it still is a rather oversimplified view of the complex uh, reality of these neural networks. And it rests on many assumptions, which um, in my opinion are not sufficiently, uh, not always sufficiently validated. When you work at the microscopic scale, uh, now you have uh, really great control over the mechanisms generating the EEG, but it's also extremely computationally intensive. And it's also, it, it's not, it's not subject specific anymore. You are not working with data from a specific subject. You are pooling data that have been recorded across a, a large number of, of individual, often more, uh, more animal than human. So the link with a clinical application, it's much, it, it's much harder. So, uh, moving forward, I think if we want to really um, uh, have a good outcome from all this research work in, in, in neuroscience, we need to be able to put all this together into a more uh, multi-scale uh, modeling approach of uh, the brain uh, to empower application, like um, better understand neurodevelopmental disorders. So what I would like to propose is a three-part uh, research program. The, the first part of this is to, um, to start creating normative resources for atypical and atypical uh, brain and um, uh, across development um, through a benchmarking approach. And I'll come back to, to this uh, point in a moment. Uh, the second part is really to uh, build these uh, more multi-scale models uh, that can uh, be used to um, study the brain at its different scale in a more integrated uh, way. So the, fir the first point 
kind of build the facts, if you want, about the brain. The second point builds the uh, models of these mechanisms and how these mechanisms relate these different facts, these different features of the brain. And the third point is to build our capacity to use these models uh, to do inference so that we, uh, we can uh, start uh, building systems that allow to make clinical decisions that are better backed from uh, our knowledge of the brain. So I'll go through these three uh, points. So, so starting with the, the first uh, part of this research pro uh, program, uh, building normative resources. Here, the goal is, is really to adopt a very systematic kind of benchmarking approach where uh, you can identify a wide range of features describing the brain or neural processes at different scales and start to really tabulate systematically uh, its value across different uh, dimensions, such as, as age, sex, and position in a normalized brain space. This is something that the engineer had, uh, the engineers has been really good at in the past, I think, to uh, having a phenomenon, uh, developing a model, and, and tabulating the values of how these variable uh, varies across uh, um, independent uh, factors. This is, I think, less well uh, done in neuroscience where uh, research has been, uh, for good reason, uh, has been uh, mostly uh, tar done in the hypothesis-driven uh, approach, which uh, in which you collect the data that are needed specifically to answer a specific question. The, 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 um, the drawback of this is that uh, often these data uh, they are tailored for your specific questions, so they are not applicable to different uh, questions that are slightly different. So uh, every investigator collects this small set of data, and these uh, data sets are often incompatible, so we cannot pull, pull or, or efforts together to build this kind of um, uh, knowledge base that uh, can uh, be a foundational part of uh, for modeling, but also for scientific investigation. So I think we have to, to have a more uh, systematic benchmarking approach to this problem. Uh, and this requires a few steps. The first one is to, uh, to gather large databases. So uh, where I'm working currently in, uh, at Miguel, we, uh, we are working on building some uh, large database with respect to autism and neurodevelopmental disorder. But this is something that is well recognized in science and that has been uh, pushed forward with, uh, by a large consortium that uh, are more and more putting uh, together these large databases that are open access, that are um, aimed to be, that, 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 which goal is to really serve as, as uh, foundational resources for a wide range of uh, investigation. So uh, the large databases are, are coming. Uh, they are already there in part and it's, it's continuing. Now, what you need to do is you also need to have a standard way to pre-process these databases because we know in neuroscience that there's a large uh, between site effect. So if you if you start pulling data from different sources, but you don't uh, um, uh, harmonize your data, what happens is that you will have um, an effect of your different source of, of different site of data collection, if you want, that will probably be bigger than most of the phenomenon you want to, to investigate. So it, it will probably not be a fruitful um, investigation. So you need to really uh, set up a standardized pipeline to harmonize uh, these data. And uh, when you have done that, that's good. You have access to large database, maybe pulled from different databases that are harmonized. But um, my point here is that you, you need to go one step further. You need to actually extract systematically features that can be reused in a systematic way across, uh, across uh, different dif uh, studies. Uh, so for that, I think we really have to harness, uh, to, to, to frame it as a community-driven uh, approach because it's a, it's a large endeavor and that cannot be done, uh, should not be done by a specific laboratory. We need to, more, more than uh, starting to benchmark ourselves these data, we need to set up the infrastructure that will allow the community to uh, contribute to that effort. And once you have done that, when you, once you 
have started extracting, tabulating these features across different dimensions, uh, you need to publish these data. And by publishing, I don't mean writing a paper about it. I mean making these data uh, discoverable, uh, machine readable, accessible to everyone. And uh, that requires applying, for example, the FAIR principles so that uh, the data are easily uh, discoverable and machine readable. It needs also embedding these data in um, with the context so for example embedding them in, in the knowledge graph and linking them with uh, ontologies and uh, a detailed uh, tracking of the provenance of these data so that um, system that 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 want to build models at scale uh, can fetch these data and integrate these data in uh, in uh, automated way so that covers the first part uh, of this research program. The second part is to um, contribute to have a more integrated modeling approach to uh, the brain across scale. So the, the brain is well known. Uh, it's well known that the brain is a very uh, a system that is described uh, can be described at very different scales. So uh, you can describe, for example. Um, a really fast um, uh, chemical reaction uh, at the level of proteins in the, in, in the cell, for example, or the dynamics of an ion channel, which is just a, a protein, a transmembrane protein. Um, so on the, on the small end, but on the large uh, spatial scale and large temporal scale, you can have processes that are uh, ranging across the whole uh, lifespan, such as aging or, or neurodevelopment. Or, and you can have, uh, on the spatial scale, you can have studies, for example, uh, if I study the coherency between EG signal uh, and frontal electrode versus occipital electrode, I'm really at the, at the scale of the whole brain. And you can even start uh, studying the uh, interagency, how, how the interaction of, of, of yourself with someone else is uh, modulating your brain. So uh, there's a wide range of scales there. And uh, the methods that we have to collect data on the brain and the approaches that we have to simulate these, uh, these process in the brain also cover this wide range of, uh, of scale because none of these recording model T or, or modeling approach uh, can currently really uh, span these different scales. Uh, and if we want to start building a more um, integrated view of the brain, um, I would argue that um, the mesoscopic uh, scale is uh, probably uh, uh, the, a key component here because it can really act as a stepping stone between the microscopic scale and the macroscopic scale. Uh, I, I think it's fair to say that most of the data that we're collecting, most of our applications are, are uh, at both end of, uh, of, of these spatial scales. So at the macroscopic and the microscopic. On the macroscopic scale, you have all sorts of non-invasive uh, recording modalities uh, in humans, for example, like fMRI or uh, EEG or uh, magnetoencephalography. Um, whereas on the microscopic scale, you have a lot of um, similar level experiment in, in animals uh, to understand, for example, how the cells behave, how high, high, like, um, uh, genetic defects will impact on ion channels and uh, change the behavior of the cells. Um, and I would argue that the mesoscopic uh, scale can act as a stepping stone to uh, start building bridges between uh, these uh, these different scales. So we have already seen um, an example of this when I discuss uh, dynamic causal modeling, in which you can take uh, uh, EEG recordings in uh, so at the macroscopic scale and uh, use these recording to estimate parameters of models that are. Uh, um, defined at the mesoscopic scale through neural mass models. Uh, some other of these bridge are less uh, present. For example, I'm not aware of uh, any uh, approach out there to 
uh, estimate from local field potential, so recording uh, at the telescopic scale, uh, to uh, use these recording to estimate parameters of uh, similar models. So uh, I would like to propose here to uh, work on uh, building some of these missing bridge and also widening maybe uh, some of these existing bridge and start to have a more um, complete integration of or modeling tools across these scales. And now the third, the third uh, portion of this research plan is uh, is about how will you how we will use these model uh, for clinical application. So I think here that uh, Bayesian a Bayesian framework is is probably the, the best approach to go uh, for different reasons. So Bayesian approach has been well developed in the, in the previous decades and they are now uh, well developed for uh, complex hierarchical models uh, as the one that uh, would need to be uh, implemented here. And uh, we now have good algorithms to fit parameters, for example, uh, Markov change Monte Carlo approach uh, to do this uh, inverse modeling um, based on a Bayesian framework. And oh, oh, you got muted, Christian. Oh. Christian, I think you're muted. Okay, uh, maybe I was speaking too much. <laughs> okay, uh, did you miss a long uh, portion? Oh no, this slide, yeah. Okay, just this slide. Okay, so um, I was saying that um, the third part of this uh, research program is uh, about how you will use these uh, multi-scale model to uh, help uh, in your uh, for clinical application to, uh, for example, for for diagnostic of some conditions, and uh, um, Bayesian approach are are I think really well uh, fitted for the for the job because they've been well developed for uh, complex mo hierarchical models and we have good algorithm to uh, fit these models, and uh, I wanted to to to, to give and I. Uh, I, I suppose that this part you didn't get. Um, I wanted to give an example of um, uh, how this can be applied. So if you take, for example, uh, you, you have designed this multi-scale uh, model and now you can uh, fit it using priors. So you use your priors on one side from uh, features that you benchmark in neurotypical population. So you have one model that is uh, using prior from neuro, uh, neurotypical population. And you can have the second model that uh, you use priors that have been, uh, that takes data from um, uh, from facts that you benchmark on, the, on your clinical population. And now you can, you can fit these two models and you can do a Bayesian model comparison. And that will tell you uh, which model is the most likely. So if if um, you get uh, new data, for, for example, uh, EEG recording or all sort of uh, clinical data that are specific to a patient and you have these models that uh, capture the behavior, the, 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 the inner working of, of the brain, and you have these two models that are fit for specifically for neurotypical and clinical population, you can fit these, the, 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 these, these new clinical data um, on this model and comparing this model, you'll be able to say, for example, okay, it's uh, the, um, the model that I have here for the neurotypical population is a uh, hundred times more likely uh, to explain the data that you get from this patient that is a clinical model. So that uh, uh, can give uh, precious information to clinicians to guide them in their, um, in their diagnostic. So in summary, um, I want to propose this, this three-part uh, research program where the first component is to adopt a really systematic way, a community-driven way to benchmark um, a wide range of features um, related to uh, the brain and the neural, biological neural networks so that we build a foundation of data foundation 
to, uh, to do the second step, which is uh, modeling the relationship between these facts through a uh, multi-scale modeling approach. So you have you build your fact and then you build the, the a model that captures the relationship between these facts and now you want to use this model to do inference to allow um, you to propose system that 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 will provide a better model inform uh, clinical decisions. The the clinician, importantly, the clinicians always remain the the master of these clinical processes, but these system would give them an additional uh, contextualization of their data uh, in light of uh, what we know on how the brain works. So that covers uh, the two big part of my speech. It covers um, previous experience and what I propose as a future research direction. Uh, but you may, you may have noticed that my uh, research proposal here is not a, like a five-year uh, uh, plan. It's, it's more, I, I made it uh, at the big picture level, if you want. So that's the, the research direction that I see myself working on for, for basically the rest of my career. So one concert that could come uh, with it in the specific context of an open position is, okay, that's fine, but uh, what, what will be the next topic of your, uh, of your grant application, for example? How, what, what will what you will you be working on in the next year? What will you get uh, money to get this research program uh, moving forward? So here I just wanted to uh, mention uh, three uh, topics that I plan to target in my first uh, grants. Um, so uh, the two first topics are more. Uh, related directly to the engineering, so they would be more kind of NSF type of grants. Uh, one is to build this infrastructure that uh, allows uh, the neuroscientific community to benchmark, uh, to start benchmarking neuroscientific data. And for that, I would like to uh, leverage this idea of uh, competitions like you have in, um, in conference. So you're certainly uh, familiar with these or at least some of you I think it's really it's really popular in in fields of um, machine learning where you have these uh, these competition organized uh, in context of conference where the organizer has uh, designed uh, they, 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 they have identified a problem they provide a database and you have rules and uh, everyone can propose solutions to this problem and I think this approach, allow a really uh, objective and systematic comparison uh, of the system. I think it's, it's a more uh, relevant, in many cases, it's a more relevant comparison than uh, independent, uh, independent um, publications. Because independent publication, as I discussed a bit earlier, they are um, often done on different databases, so using different evaluation methods, so they are not always easy to compare. The second topic, uh, so, so the first one is really associated with the first part of my three-part uh, research proposal. The second one is associated with the second part, and it's um, more uh, to create this bridge between uh, the mesoscopic uh, scale and the microscopic scale to be able to uh, apply Bayesian inversion uh, of uh, mesoscopic recording like local field potential to estimate parameters for a point neurons network. Um, so, so yeah, so the, these two topics are more uh, directly focusing on the engineering, so they are good NSF uh, kind of topic. Uh, the third one would be more an NIH kind of, of, of topic where it's, it's centered more around the application, uh, and that would be uh, the continuation of a research uh, uh, project that I'm already uh, involved uh, in which uh, aim to um, study uh, how uh, if the enter um, the evalu ev evaluate if interhemispheric synchrony could be used as a biomarker for autism. So these would be the my first three topic uh, that I would try to uh, to get uh, grants for. Um, now another concern that can come is to uh, question about how does uh, this uh, experience and uh, these uh, research direction relates to uh, your uh, department. So I listed here uh, 
example of techniques and skills that I had to use in the past for, for this kind of research and that I'm feel fairly confident that I will have to use again in, in the future. And you can see that many of these uh, skills and expertise fall directly in uh, computer science and uh, or have a significant overlapping with uh, computer science. So I'm not, uh, I, I think it's, it's um, uh, your department is a perfect fit for this kind of project. And uh, finally, I would just, uh, with respect to teaching at the, at the department, uh, I would just want to uh, show you this slide uh, where I listed uh, courses that I would be uh, comfortable to teach uh, um, given my uh, background. Uh, I put in bold uh, the three uh, top three course, let's say that would have the best fit with uh, uh, my current interests and my background, but uh, really any of these, uh, of these course, I would feel comfortable to uh, teach at some point. I also uh, list on the right uh, two uh, topics of, uh, that I would be happy to build uh, a new course proposal on uh, eventually. Um, so either uh, centering around an analytical approach to uh, like um, to study neuroimaging and neuroscience, so signal processing, uh, machine learning, uh, and and uh, image processing uh, approach, and also there's a lot of statistical uh, uh, tools that has to be um, uh, used to do these kind of analysis. And the second one is more centered around uh, modeling approaches in, in computational neuroscience. So uh, covering, for example, the different kind of approach uh, that I presented previously across scales. Uh, of course, the, the, the work that I presented is uh, done in collaboration with uh, many different persons. So I listed here uh, the main PI with uh, trying to put the keywords uh, closer to PIs that are associated with. Uh, so that doesn't list all my, my co-authors or my collaborator, but the, the, the main PI on the different uh, project that I, uh, that I worked on. And that's it. Uh, I'll be happy to, uh, I thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to, uh, to answer any question. Uh Thanks, Christian. I really enjoyed the presentation. And I was just wondering um, what relationship your research has to maybe uh, discovering algorithms for training artificial neural networks? Mm, um, so I'm really, I'm really working on the, um, on the biological side of neural networks. So, um, so, so my focus is really biological neural networks. Now there's a, there's a um, lot of interest in developing a neuromorphic kind of compute, more neuromorphic uh, computing approaches where um, neural, artificial neural networks could um, further uh, inspire themselves from a biological neural network. So in that respect, uh, it, it, I would say it's not uh, it's not an application that I myself plan to move forward as a PI, but I would be uh, thrilled to have occasions to collaborate with people that want to uh, move forward these kind of uh, application. And uh, for that, I think I, I, I could be um, uh, my expertise uh, in and my knowledge on. Uh, the biology uh, of, uh, of biological neural networks could be uh, invaluable. Okay, thank you. Uh, Christian, uh, this is Biplov. Uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, so first, I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, my question is uh, how, given uh, the various things that you have been doing, uh, how do you think uh, uh, your work will stand out uh, given the rest of the crowd. Meaning, uh, what do you think uh, uh, you would want to do differently from other groups which are working in this area uh, to really um, stand out? Yeah, okay. So um, I think the, um, the specific topic that would be, that I would hope uh, 
my research would be recognized for in long term is really this uh, multi-scale modeling approach. So I think there's a currently a gap in the, in the literature, in the knowledge. Um, I think it's partly, partly due to the fact that it requires um, a specific kind of uh, experience uh, to, uh, to model the brain across these different uh, scales. So you've seen from my background that I uh, kind of <laughs> move uh, to different, not different field, but uh, uh, different subfields, if you want. Uh, I covered quite a, a large um, uh, spectrum of, of approaches, and that's uh, not a classical background. Often people are more uh, early in, the in their career, they set up in uh, one of these niche and they stand to stay in this niche, uh, in this niche. So I think um, I have a particular background to address this uh, problem of um, building models that better integrate knowledge across these scales. And that's where I hope uh, to uh, stand out. Okay, next. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Please. Yeah. Okay, uh, Christian, uh, I know you um, have uh, most interest in the, you know, this uh, uh, neural disease kind of aspect of neuroscience. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you also have, you know, have some kind of interest in like a many mechanism or memory mechanism and uh, you know those kind of uh, research sorry memory magnetism yeah memory and uh, many you know many mechanism of the new ah, learning mechanisms yes. yeah uh, kind of things we discussed also yeah <laughs> so so um uh my current field of, of so, so my current research concentrate more on uh, neuro, neurodevelopmental disorder, but I'm really interested in understanding uh, the inner workings of the brain in general. And um, learning mechanisms, for example, how, the, uh, how these mechanisms are, are working in uh, the hippocampus are really interested, uh, for, uh, interesting for me. For example, um, so I spoke early in the beginning of my talk about sleep spindles, and one of the big uh, uh, interesting topic in sleep spindle is the fact that, uh, so sleep spindle is, is, is a brain wave at 1116 Hertz, but we found that these uh, brain waves, so in the brain you have a hierarchy of brain waves, if you want, that are uh, coupled through, um, often through a phase amplitude coupling meaning that um, you'll have a slower waves that, that uh, the amplitude of this lower wave, so the phase of this low, slower wave will tell you when you'll have burst of activity in um, an, a higher frequency, uh, uh, at a higher frequency. So you have, in sleep, you have uh, slow waves, which are around one earth, for example, that are coupled that way with sleep spindle, which are known to be associated with memory consolidation. And uh, these are also coupled with uh, ripples in the hippocampus. Hippocampus, obviously, that is really well known for uh, his role in, in memory consolidation. And so you can start to put hypothesis about how the memory get uh, consolidated in the brain because in, during the sleep you you have this process of memory consolidation and one of this hypothesis is that uh, so the, the the memory have to be uh, transferred from uh, local stor uh, temporary storage if you want to long term storage and the long term storage would be more frontal uh, brain regions and the idea here is that the, this uh, coupling of uh, of uh, of different waves that are associated with memory could be the mechanism through which uh, these memory are, are um, consolidated from a temporary storage in hippocampal region to uh, frontal regions, for example. 
and as as engineer probably it most uh, most probably uh, uh, links to uh, this concept in, in communication where, where you have this slow wave that is your uh, uh, carrying wave right and you have and you modulate your 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 information at a higher frequency on this on this carrier wave so so for me as, as someone who has uh, an engineering background it makes a lot of sense that you would have a similar mechanism in, in the brain. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I if I answered your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I actually have a question. If we have time, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. And since neuromorphic brought up my main research topic, because I'm neuromorphic, I had some very general question from you. So there is a uh, there is a research thrust these days in uh, recognizing how brain work uh, in which we focus on uh, implementing the component like the Hodgkin Huxley neuron that I mentioned on this neuromorphic hardware and give it enough time to evolve and let them surprise us. And then we can see if we can figure out something, discover something that we haven't seen before through this kind of brain on chip implementation. It's not brain on chip in that term, but like having a chip that kind of worked like a brain and letting it do the work. So what is your take on that? That's something that I'm interested in and I'm focusing on, so. Um, I, as many things, that, as many things in, in science and engineering, the closer you get to the problem, the, the more you appreciate the incredible complexity of it <laughs> and uh, uh, as I went from higher scale to smaller scale I realized how a single cell or even a single synapse is, is so complicated there's so many mechanisms at play there um, that we we are are starting to scratch the surface but we we need to remain conscious that we are uh, just scratching the surface um, so in the brain, there's some self-organizing mechanisms. And if we can start to identify these self-organizing mechanisms, we can definitely start to reproduce it uh, in silico, be it uh, in software or in hardware, and, um, and use these uh, principles. But um, I think it, it's dangerous. I, I think. We need to keep um, uh, keep reasonable in our expectation and and not to have to be making too much of wishful thinking uh, because uh, if you use the right mechanisms to self organize, you'll have a bit of this self organization. But um, the 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 number of mechanisms that are probably at play to uh, hardware the these neural network so genetic mechanisms and uh, uh, like how for example the axons uh, uh, grows uh, like it's a whole topic of research right how how the axon go, goes from one part and grows it, its axon and find the right connection at the right place all these mechanisms if they are not um, model correctly uh, the capability of the system to self-organize and to have some emerging uh, intelligence out of it uh, will be uh, comparatively limited to biological system. So as we gain more understanding in these self-organizing mechanism and we integrate them better in, in these um, in these uh, in this kind of research, I think uh, it will improve, but it may take a, a while before uh, um, uh, it really it, it really became a game changer. That's that's my uh, no, that, that, that makes that's sense. A, uh, educated guess, uh, but it's no, not it my told, specific research of. And that's uh, right. That, it totally makes sense. Yeah, that's right. It makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a multidisciplinary research, so it involves yeah. a lot of different parameters, yeah, that's right. Thank yeah. you. That's what we are hoping for also with our neuroscience colleagues uh, that are already there, uh, an institute of mind and brain and other people. Yeah, I, hope I surely you. hope to have the occasion to contribute to this uh, discussion. I would be thrilled to, to have this discussion. Sure. Okay, uh, any more questions? Any last one or two questions? Oh, 
Well, okay. In that case, uh, we'll uh, call it a seminar and uh, please uh, sign up for, uh, 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 you know, meeting with uh, Krishan at your own schedule. He's available all of today and tomorrow in case you're not already communicated with Andy. Thank you very much, Krishan. Sorry, uh, my apology. Uh, what happened was um, uh, I, uh, we had a previous break-in in our uh, uh, Zoom call. So I had put in more security measures. Among the security measure was uh, to allow only US participants or US and <laughs> India and Nepal participants whom I know uh, are routinely part of this call. And uh, Canada was left out. <laughs> That's I mean, I and then once you start the meeting, you cannot, um, um, you, you, you have to, you know, you cannot edit it. And hence we have wow. to do this one. And so it was, you know, this is, um, problem and i mean routinely you see when you want to really have high security you always have some you know challenges with the systems and i uh, got into that problem now so sorry mm -hmm. to everyone also you are also to jump but i'm glad that you know 30 people joined us here maybe more than 30 and that is wonderful thank you very much and the links will be available as soon as possible for anybody who could not join talk to you soon bye bye